This is MTG Degree. My name is Luke, and of course today I am being joined by Noah Bradley. Now, some of you may not be educated enough to know Noah Bradley. Let me educate you. He's done a great number of artworks for Magic, including our beloved Full Art Lands from the current set, and all of the enemy Shockland expeditions, Overgrown Tomb, Steam Vents, Godless Shrine, Sacred Foundry, and Breeding Pool. Hello, Noah. Hello. How's it going? It's going pretty Ugh. darn well. I mean, finally getting this interview done. <laughs> pretty yeah, exciting. It's, uh, it's good to be doing this. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. No problem. So, there are a bunch of questions that I think every magic artist gets asked. So we're just going to go through some of the ones that everyone wants to know from every magic artist, for the most part. Uh-huh. So the first yep. one is, do you play magic? <laughs> I, that probably is the most frequently asked question at GPs. Um, and the answer is, I know how to play, but I honestly don't have the time or money to play regularly at this point. I'd love to. It's a great game. I love CCGs and stuff. I grew up mm -hmm. playing uh, Star Wars CCG back in the day. Oh, man, that's, um, that's an old one. Yeah, awesome awesome game back in the day. So I, I love games like that, but I just I just don't have the time. And I will honestly say that I do play some Hearthstone, and if Magic was ever that <laughs> simple and easy to play, uh, I would probably play it online all the time. So, okay, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> we'll consider whether or not to edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> Let the pitchforks, pitchforks not be raised, right? Yeah, exactly. So you're a pretty recent artist for Magic. Um, so how and when... Did you get in contact with Wizards? I've heard lots of different stories uh, for how this happens. Uh, I, it was about probably almost about four and a half, five years ago now. Um, but it was right as I was coming out of art school. Uh, I was graduating from from art school, and probably right around right around graduation, I sent out a wave of postcards to art directors and stuff like that. And um, one of them to the art director there at Wizards of the Coast for Magic. And um, about a month later, I got an email from him saying he'd love to work with me and gave me my first assignment of a set of basic lands. Wow, that's pretty impressive right out of art school. Yeah, it was uh, super impressive. Yeah, because my next thing I was going to ask was that some people think that making art for Magic is kind of the ultimate resume builder in fantasy art, right? Would you right. say would you say that that's accurate? Like once you've done something for magic, everyone's like, "Oh, he's done stuff for magic. He's good enough for us." Type thing. Yeah, it's it's certainly a huge credibility thing uh, if you want to do illustration of any kind. Uh, although I will say that once you get it, you realize you're kind of a little shocked that that's the ceiling, that there isn't anything more, and it's, it's somewhat disappointing in that sense, but uh, I mean, it is obviously a wonderful gig, and I was thrilled to get it, still am. It has been a wonderful thing for certainly building a fan base and name recognition and stuff like that for me. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a great gig. Yeah, I'm expecting most people that watch this video already know who you are. I'm just, I'm just mm. going to get the extra juice, if that's possible. <laughs> uh -huh. So, I have heard that you're a digital painter, right? Uh-huh. I've also heard that the way that digital painting works is you tell the computer, paint me this, please, <laughs> and then the computer paints it for you. Is that the way that it works? Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, it's, it's super easy. I don't even have to do anything. Um, <laughs> but no, but uh, seriously, it's, it's, it's baffling to me how many people think that I don't do anything. Um, and are a little shocked at how manual everything is if, when I actually show them. I mean, I am hand-painting a lot of things. And there are some tricks, and there are some more tricks that I'm adding to my uh, uh, repertoire of tools. But for the most part, you're just making stuff just how you would on Canvas. So uh, I think it would surprise a lot of people. One of these days I'll record a video of a magic painting, specifically a magic painting to show people. Mm -hmm. But I do try to at least post up a fair bit of the process work so people can get an idea for uh, the process these pieces go through. Yeah, that's actually 
that's actually a fair thing to mention, which is I was on your website and I saw that if you want to see how you do landscape sketches, you've got like uh, like speed painting. You can watch the pro mm -hmm. at work for just a couple of bucks practically. Yep. That's yeah, I've got some. I've also got some free stuff if you're too lazy for that. Um, <laughs> I've got a few free videos over on YouTube. So oh really? I didn't even find that. Channel. Okay, well, yep. we're going to have to link everyone there. In fact, let's just say yep. it's on the video right now. There'll be one of those little poppy-uppy things, right? So another question for you is when you get art leads from Wizards, I've heard that they're kind of like, uh, they're like, we want this kind of thing, and they say, and here's kind of the world that we've built, and so don't put something that's, like, not in the world in there type thing. So they give mm -hmm. a bit of direction, yeah. right? They don't just let you, like, go anywhere. Um, right. It's it's pretty specific. Do you... do you, I've heard two things. I've heard artists say before that restrictions, like, stop their creative flow. And then I've heard other artists say that working within restrictions makes them a stronger artist because they have to, like, stretch in new directions. Do you, do you mm. have any opinion on this? Uh, I would say both are probably true. Uh, I would say freedom is wonderful, and I love it whenever I get it. And sometimes <laughs> wizards will let me be pretty darn free with what I'm doing. For instance, all the all the basics I've done have been just do a basic that is, you know, set generally in this world, but come up with whatever you want. Mm -hmm. uh, so tons of freedom there. Um, actually, same sort of goes for the expeditions. They were pretty open-ended. Um, obviously, I had the name to work with, and it had to match the name and look like it was in Zendikar. But aside from that, it was it was pretty open-ended. Um, on the other end, the specific direction, uh, the ability to work under that is basically what we're paid to do as illustrators. Right. Uh, so, so if if you're not comfortable working with a lot of direction, then you're not really an illustrator. So, uh, yeah, I think I think both sides of the coin uh, are perfectly valid and very helpful. And learning to make a compelling image, even given a lot of restrictions and a lot of uh, pre-direction, I guess, is a really important skill for us as illustrators. Now, I'm going to pick out one little thing from that, which is that you said that you knew the name of the cards. Do you always know the name of the cards? I was under the impression that they try to keep some cards, you know, super secret from everyone, so you right. don't even know the name right. of the card sometimes. Uh, sometimes that's the case. Uh, basically, my impression of how things are working is that everyone on all the teams are working on these cards at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so the guys making the play mechanics are working on it, the guys writing the cards are working on it, and the guys painting it are working on it all at the same time. So at the time that our assignments go out, sometimes we'll have a finished title, sometimes we'll have a working title. Um, sometimes if it's obviously a reprint or something like that, we'll have the actual title. Oh, okay. Um, and on the flip side, uh, the writers, depending on how quickly the artists work, uh, will sometimes have our sketches to work from, and sometimes they won't. Um, so sometimes when they're writing the titles or the uh, flavor text, we'll already have something visual to work from at the same time. Um, so it's all sort of simultaneously heading towards uh, completion. So, uh, for instance, uh, I've had... Um, so for one, uh, for one example that I remember getting the working title for and not the actual title for, uh, Mizium Mortar is one of my more popular cards mm -hmm. that people would yeah. remember. Uh, the working title for that was Ember Rockets. Um, so that's that's the card that I painted. I painted Ember Rockets. <laughs> Ember Rockets. So, that's a pretty lame yeah. name. <laughs> so yeah, they uh, they changed it. So it was just a working title. Uh, it's just something to get us going in the right direction. So right, yeah. Yeah. So for the expeditions, obviously, I knew what exactly what I was painting, and I knew I was painting exactly that. Yeah, the Godless Shrine, by the way, as far as the expeditions go, is the one to me that looks the most art specific. It really looks. Like, you know, Zendikar, because it's got the uh, the Eldrazi, like, monument there. Was that one, right. did that one have a little bit more, or did you go in and pull that out from what you had seen on Zendikar before? Um, no, that was, uh, that was somewhat specific direction. He wanted um, some sort of um, shrine for the Eldrazi that is, you know, old and a little bit broken up and stuff like that. So, yeah, I mean, he definitely wanted some sort of 
old monument sculpture thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, looks awesome. By the way, <laughs> card looks. Great. Thank you, thank oh. you. It's it's one of my favorites. You're you're close enough to magic to uh, know how rare those cards that you uh, did the art for are, right? <laughs> I didn't realize when I was painting them, like the art director who I was working with told us, these are going to be really rare guys. And we were like, yeah, 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 it's just, it's, it's going to be a rare card, whoop de doo nobody's going to care about this stuff. And then when they came out and people started like saying exactly how rare they are, I uh, suddenly had a, an appreciation for uh, just how rare they were. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, another question. So, you've done a lot of art for lands in Magic's history. Mm-hmm. Even a couple of dual lands for Magic Online, which, by the way, turned out mm-hmm. great. Thank um, you. Wizards seem to have you pinned up as their uh, landscape guy. Would you say that's uh-huh. accurate? And uh, if so, yeah. would you, do you really like landscapes the best when it comes to when you sit down to paint? Yes and yes. Uh, I, I really do love painting landscapes. Uh, I do paint other stuff for my own personal satisfaction. I paint some creatures and occasionally characters and stuff like that. But for, for Magic, I really do enjoy painting landscapes. Um, you know, I do some spell cards too, so it's some explodey stuff going on occasionally. Sure. Um, but yeah, for the most part, I just really enjoy painting landscapes. And there aren't that many guys that really do enjoy that. Um, there, are, there are a number that can do it and can do it very well. Um, but as far as being a speciality, there's only a few guys that really do. So it's a nice little niche. I don't have to compete with all the other magic artists to get jobs and stuff like that. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of okay with my position as it stands. Cool. Um, the other thing that I noticed because of this landscape tendency is that even when you're doing a creature or something or a spell, it seems like you like to put your figures... if Okay, let's pretend that I'm like an art critic, right? And I'm like examining <laughs> your, your stuff. So I notice that you like to put your figures in a fairly large surrounding, and it's rare that you focus on just the figure. Uh, so, uh, for example, Anger of the Gods. You've got him, like, hiding under the tree, but mm-hmm. an alternative one could have been, like, you know, a zoom in on someone's face that looks, like, terrified, and then you can see, like... Uh, stuff coming out of the sky in the background type thing. Mm -hmm. So would you say that you find that the landscapes uh, maybe, like, teach more than the figures do sometimes? Yeah, yeah. I I, I certainly probably do uh, focus more on the the overall world and the overall, uh, I guess, landscape that they're they're residing in and living in. Just because, I guess, that's my own personal take on things. I tend to like... I, I like li- life zoomed out a little bit and uh, to appreciate everything that's going on around somebody. So uh, I like that those larger scale views of things. Um, they just tend to fascinate me more. I always remember watching uh, movies as a kid and uh, always loving those big establishing shots where you get oh, those yeah. huge scenes with all, all this stuff going on and this crazy epic scale of this stuff. So I guess I, I just try to do a little bit of that in most of my pieces. Next question. Uh, so... You've made a lot of magic cards now, a fair amount. Which magic card are you most proud of so far? Um, I still love my moat that I did for Magic Online. Oh yeah, looks uh, good. that's a personal favorite of mine. I love it. Uh, I also, I also really like the Jeskai Barricade. That's a personal favorite of mine. The art director really loved that one, and it was actually accepted into an an annual fantasy book. Uh, the uh, storm annuals, um, so it's it's a bit of a competition to get into those books. So it was it was nice to get a magic card into there for once. Yeah, the Jeskai Barricade just looked so epic in comparison to like the card power. It's not like that's <laughs> oh, really hard, but you just made this awesome oh, illustration. You're like boom, and yeah. then you look at the card and you're like, hmm, I like what Noah's yeah, done. That <laughs> That happens a lot in Magic, is doing a painting and being really proud of it and just hoping beyond hope that it ends up on something really good so it actually sees play. Because it, it, it's honestly incredibly disappointing doing a card and nobody ever using it. Because I've done paintings that I really like, but nobody ever sees them and cares about them because they're on awful cards. Yeah, that, that's so. kind of the fate of Magic artists, I suppose. <laughs> 
Yeah. So here's a question about magic artists. Do you have a favorite magic artist other than yourself? Do I have a favorite magic artist? Uh, it's really tough. The, see, the thing is, is that like when I was a student starting out, it was all the guys working on magic that tended to be the guys I was looking up to, mm-hmm. and the ones that I would want to imitate and um, try to be like. But there are a ton of artists now, um, and some new additions to magic that are just they just blow me away every time I see stuff. Uh, like Carla Ortiz, uh, her stuff is just incredible stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I love Wes Bird's stuff. Uh, Jason Chan always does amazing stuff. Jamie Jones is incredible. I'm a huge longtime fan of John Avon and uh, actually got to meet him this say, past I, year. I thought you um, might say him because he does lots of uh, basic lands. Yeah, he was he was certainly an inspiration for me, and um, I do remember when I was painting my first basic lands, I had uh, a few of his cards uh, on the easel next to me to sort of serve as a goal for where I needed to go with them. Mm-hmm. So, so it, yeah, yeah, definitely an inspiration for me. Yeah, he's always impressed me with how he's managed to almost put ambiance over detail. Like when you look yeah. at his at his uh, forest from Unhinged, I think it is. There's uh, very little detail there, but you feel like a right. really in deep fantasy forest. It's quite amazing. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's an incredible artist and a really nice guy, too. And speaking of detail, how do you know when you're done with a card? To be honest, when the deadline rolls around, that's, that's always a good indicator. Um, when, yeah. when, when the painting is due and the art director is complaining that it's that it's a little bit past due, uh, that's that's usually when it's done. But for me, I guess when I've said what I need to say in the painting and nothing stands out as looking too unfinished or bad, that's the extreme simplified version. But that's honestly the goal I look for. Mm-hmm. And that's actually something really interesting. For most magic artists, I feel like they look at the art and they realize how small it's going to be printed. So they don't just Uh, go ham on the detail that will never show up. So when you look at it on a big print, it looks almost a little undetailed. Almost like a, I don't know, impressionist, right? Did you always have that view of it that, you know, this is definitely not going to be seen, you know? So I'm not going to, like, carve a little crack on this rock or whatever when it's not going to show up in the final printing. Or did you ever uh, um, go ham when it was just completely overboard? Um, I, I and probably most magic artists probably do still paint a little bit too much stuff in there. Um, for the most part. Like, there are details on a lot of my cards that nobody has ever noticed and will notice unless they see a gigantic print of them. Um, and that's fine. Website, uh, I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, yeah. My website, you can see pretty darn huge files of everything. So uh, I'm kind of okay with that. But on the other hand, I really enjoy doing the painterly stuff uh, mm-hmm. where it is really loose when you look up close to it. And I actually do try to kind of do that with a lot of my work. And even my personal work that's it's probably a little bit tighter and more uh, rendered out than my magic stuff, even that, if you actually zoom in, uh, they're really, really loose up close. Uh, most of the time, it just becomes scribbles at a certain point. So uh, I think it's a natural thing to do. So I think it would be fair at this point to say that you've reached some, some success in fantasy illustration, right? Yeah, I think, I think that's fair. I think that's totally fair. So what advice would you give to somebody who is an artist that wants to do fantasy illustration but hasn't broken into the field or anything like that? Let's say they're also not as great at art yet. They're on the path. Right. Well, see, there's the thing, is that um, it all does come down to that skill level and where they're at, and that determines the advice that I give people. Because there's really only two things you have to be aware of and have to focus on when you're trying to do this stuff. And the first one is how good your stuff is, how technically competent it is, how interesting it is, uh, how finished it is, and 
how appropriate it is for the companies you want to work for. Uh, if I do work that looks like it's for Hearthstone and I try to get work for Magic, I will never get work from Magic because it looks all stylized and hyper-saturated and colorful yeah, and stuff like goofy. that. Uh, you, have, you have to show a portfolio that looks like the stuff you want to get hired for. Mm -hmm. um, just think about it from their perspective. They want to hire people that they know are going to do exactly what they want them to do. So um, there's that side of the coin. And then on the other side of the coin, you just have to make sure your work is getting seen by the right people. And thankfully, it's really, really easy to do that these days. Um, most companies either have a submission email or the art director's emails are incredibly easy to find and you can just email them directly with portfolio most of the time they'll look at it and if your work is appropriate then you're going to get a job so there are those two sides of the coin and for most people I would say it's working on those fundamental uh, technical skills more so than the promotion side of things uh, most of them if they had better work uh, are doing more than enough promotion uh, there are a few cases where I see people that have incredible work and aren't getting any jobs, uh, and for them, they do, do they do need to focus more on the promotion side of things. All right. Well, I think I think that counts as a pretty thorough answer. <coughs> uh, yeah. So, the next question for you is: You've written this thing called "Don't Go to Art School," which is uh -huh. some of your advice for. I guess not even fantasy illustrators, just people. Yeah. Do you want Do you want to go over like a couple of points there that uh might might interest people in that that article because I found it really interesting to read personally. Yeah. Um. It was a it was a rant that I wrote uh, a few years ago now, and I just got fed up with hearing all of these friends of mine uh, complaining about how much student debt they had from art school. And uh, I started doing a little bit of actual research into how much art schools cost and discovered that they are well over $200,000 to go to for four years. And that's an astronomical figure. Uh, yeah. Just incredible, incredible amount of money. And the problem is, is that a lot of artists are not really told the whole truth when they're going into it. They're, they're, I mean, I've gotten the form myself that says, you know, financial aid in the form of loans, um, <laughs> you know, but somehow saying it's financial aid. And they're not really given the full severity of taking out these, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans. Uh, I mean, that's a house in certain parts of the country. And, uh, you know, that's not, a, that's not a light thing to go into. And this is also something that can't be forgiven ever. You can declare bankruptcy and it'll still come after you. Mm -hmm. um, death is quite literally the only way to get rid of it. So, Which is with all that said, I just, got, I just got pissed off. No, no, not at all. <laughs> uh, don't do that. Uh, so I just got fed up and had to call them out on it. And... Uh, I think it. I think it went really well. I think it got a lot of people talking. Probably most people were on my side. There were a few people that thought I was an idiot, but um, I think in general I succeeded in getting people to talk about it, which is the main thing I just want people to do: is really think about the financial repercussions of what they're doing, and make sure it's the right thing they're doing. And you said the figure two hundred thousand, which to me seems mm -hmm. like you've got to have some pretty stable income which really makes me wonder when you're a fantasy illustrator what are your chances of doing like close to 100 percent freelance work as compared to getting some sort of sweet in-house thing where you know you, you know like for the next two or three years that i have a stable art job which is perhaps right. not not the norm right yeah, I mean, problem, certainly if you want to do illustration, uh, almost all of it is freelance. There's a few in-house positions, but very few. So income is, for one thing, very uh, varied and also uh, not incredible income. I mean, it's good, certainly, but it's not, uh, you know, mind-blowing tons of money. And to pay off a loan like that, you need tons and tons of money. Uh, the standard 10-year you know, payment plan for that $200,000 loan is about $2,000 every month for 10 years. Um, so you need $24,000 every year of after-tax income 
to pay off that loan. Um, so if you're making forty thousand dollars a year, you know, normal median American income, you're going to have about five thousand dollars for your living expenses. So Excellent. yeah, if if you live at mom and dad's house for ten years, paying off your loans, then you can do it. <laughs> Jeez. When you put it that way, yeah. it just seems like the absolute worst idea. Yeah, it's it's an awful, awful thing. Huh. Anyone that goes to art school and takes on the full loans is just, I don't know, making an extreme gamble. Mm. So what is, in your opinion, what what's the most lucrative thing that you can do in illustration? Is it like working... Have you tried working for uh, movies? That actually seems really interesting to me, and it seems like you'd have this, the skill set for something like, you know, they want a bunch of drawings of, like, Middle Earth, you know, for, like, right. this Hobbit film or whatever. Do you yeah. guys also tend to branch out in there? Yeah, a lot of people do tend to move into sort of the concept art entertainment <laughs> um, sector, and you can make certainly more money than illustration. Um, fantasy game illustration is, is not great pay. Uh, if you move into video games or film, you're going to make a lot more money. Uh, beyond that, uh, if you really, really just want to do it for money, uh, get into advertising and start doing artwork for them. Uh, you can make huge, huge, huge amounts of money uh, on just individual paintings. I've done small amounts of advertising work just because I don't particularly enjoy it and have never sought it out. And it's been the easiest work I've ever done for the greatest <laughs> pay per hour. Okay, so, well, yeah. maybe the people who have made that mistake of art school can use your wisdom here to pay off those insane loans. <laughs> yeah. So, the next question, which I totally forgot to ask when I was talking about the beginnings of art and whatnot, is when did you, when did you start painting? Was it like you rolled out of the womb and, you know, grabbed your crayon and slammed it down on the paper? Or at what age did you start uh, really being an artistic dude? Um, I've always sort of liked making stuff. I liked building stuff and making stuff. And whether that was paintings or drawings or just, you know, building something out of paper or cardboard or wood or whatever it happened to be, um, I just liked making things. I liked, you know, stepping back at the end of the day and looking at something I had made. Um, I really just enjoyed that. And it probably wasn't until I was in community college, which was really young, uh, when I was you know, probably 14 or 15, that I started taking drawing classes in college that uh, I really got into it, really started enjoying it. And I still just treated it as a hobby for a few years after that, but uh, it was a really enjoyable hobby for me and uh, one that, uh, one that uh, took a lot of my time. I just, I just really loved it. It was a lot of fun. Now... I know you're talking about big bucks selling your art, and that actually raises a question that goes all the way back to the digital, which is that for magic painters that paint physical, mm -hmm. there are some seriously uh, devoted magic players who pay close to insane sums for that original magic card art. Um, have you oh, ever yeah. considered doing uh, like oils and stuff just because, you know, you might be able to sell that for like twenty thousand dollars if it's on a like, <laughs> even a half decent card, you know? Yeah, uh, and I have done a few uh, oil painting. I, I don't have the time or space right now to really paint regularly like that, but I have done a few oil paintings and um, have sold them for decent amounts of money. Not twenty thousand uh, dollars. I'm not Chris Ron, but uh, you know I. I've still made pretty decent money on it, and it is a great way if you have those skill sets to make a lot more money off of magic. Um, suddenly, the commission prices turn into these pretty huge figures uh, mm -hmm. when you calculate in selling the original and selling prints and all that sort of stuff afterwards. So right. yeah. So when you talk about that, you've done some that were uh, physically painted in the past. Can you name a couple of cards so we can look at see if uh, we can spot yeah. a difference? Uh, yeah, the uh, the basics from Zendikar actually were all oil paintings. Uh, they have oh, a fair okay. bit of digital touch up on them, but that's just to make them look more cohesive with the rest of my work. So those were all done. Uh, there's a few more basics that I did back in M13, 
the uh, the island and the forest were both oil paintings. Um, uh, those both been sold off. And also in Theros, there was a little card fade into antiquity. Mm -hmm. uh, that was a tiny little oil painting. Okay, cool. So, yeah. And since we're on the topic of digital, I completely forgot to ask. So digital yeah. painters do get this one huge bonus, which is that that they they'll take a landscape and then kind of like put it in the background, lower the transparency, and paint over a little bit, maybe even sample some colors uh, to try to like increase their realism. Is uh huh. Do you ever do yep, that, like that, sampling that like is, that? that that is a technique referred to as photo bashing, and uh, I didn't do I didn't do it for a long time. Uh, I actually do it now, um, from time to time. Not all of my paintings will have it, but a lot of them actually will now. Uh, it does drastically speed up the process and um, drastically increase the level of detail you can get in a short amount of time. And um, for me, uh, I use mostly photos that I shoot myself, just. Out of personal preference, yeah, uh, I tend to shoot a lot of, of them. Yeah, I, I shoot a lot of photos, um, mm -hmm. and um, so I tend to I tend to use a lot of my own photos in them. Um, but yeah, I, I, I will definitely use that in some of my stuff, and uh, even some of my recent stuff that I haven't shown yet. I've even started pulling in some three D renders that I've made uh, to use for that. So uh, pretty much any trick you can think of, uh, an artist will eventually start using. But mm -hmm. uh, so what you're saying is, is that you've made cards that we don't know about yet? Oh yeah, still a bunch of cards you don't know about. Noah, I assume that <laughs> you love this show so much that you would break your non-disclosure <laughs> agreement with Wizards to discuss these new cards with us. Oh, absolutely. That's <laughs> why I'm here. All right. Well, yeah. we'll just have to look forward to those in the future. Yeah, I've got I've got a few that I'm really proud of. So yeah, those those stuff to look forward to. And speaking of the future, people in the very near future can go in the description of this video and find many a link to your website and your store where you can buy playmats and whatnot. Definitely that yep. article, Don't Go to Art School, very interesting. And uh, where else would you like them to find you on you know, Twitter or Facebook or any sort of thing like that? Uh, I actually left Facebook last year, so uh, I'm, I'm only on Twitter in these days, so if you want to follow me there, uh, just go to twitter.com slash Noah Bradley. Yeah, check out my YouTube videos. Uh, go to my website, sign up for my mailing list. I send out whatever art that I'm doing uh, if you want to see my newest paintings and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, if you go to actually noahbradley.com slash magic, you can go check out high-res files of every single magic piece I've done so far. Yeah, and I'm, I'm just going to uh, let the viewers know that I totally cheated and pulled all of those images for use in this video, because <laughs> they're really nice. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And you yeah. just happen to I, that I up hate the last when week. artists only put out, like, super tiny little files of mm -hmm. their gorgeous paintings. Uh, it drives me insane, so. All right, well, it's been fantastic having you here. Thanks for educating us about art and magic and basically everything. Yeah, thanks for having me. Have a good day, Noah, and I hope that we can see you again soon. Sounds good. Well, everyone, that was Noah Bradley joining us today. Of course, we can't give him the applause that he deserves because this is YouTube. However, I'd love it if you guys would go in the comments, give him some comments, give him some likes on the video. Thank you for listening, and as always, I'll see you next video.